Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our first session for day today in this our 150th panel of sessions at the Inter-American Commission. Today we are having a bit of a special hearing because it's going to be longer than usual. Uh, normally we just have an hour. We have an hour and a half to really a progress report on um, a, a, a report that the Commission did on the state of Jamaica. So it's a very imp important for us to have full and frank information. I see that my predecessor, who was the rapporteur for Jamaica before I took over, is here with us, um, Professor Diana Shelton, and I'm happy about that because she undertook the actual mission to Jamaica. So we are going to have um, more time for each of the parties. I want to welcome especially the state of uh, Jamaica. I, I see the Ambassador Vassiani is here with us. He will introduce his colleague. And we have a full panel um, of petitioners. Um, welcome to all of you. And I will ask you to introduce yourselves. I know some of you, but I don't know all of you, so I prefer if you introduce yourselves. We would give you half an hour to present, and we will also give the state half an hour. Then we will ask some questions, and hopefully we'll have more time for dialogue. So I'll begin um, with the petitioners. Thank you, Commissioner Antoine. Um, I am Caroline Gomes. I am representing Caribbean Vulnerable Communities Coalition this morning. With me, starting from my left, Mr. David Silvera, representing Jamaicans for Justice. Mr. Alexis Goff, representing Jamaicans for Justice. To my right, Mr. Ivan Cruikshank, representing Jama Jamaica Forum for Lesbians, All Sexuals, and Gays, better known as JFLAG. And Ms. Angeline Jackson, representing Quality of Citizenship Jamaica. Um, we will, the first four will present as a group and to be followed by Ms. Jackson. And we will begin providing you with a PowerPoint presentation, which is in front of you, an update on the human rights situation in Jamaica by CVC, JFJ, and JFLAG. By way of overview, the high level of violence that citizens of Jamaica face daily causes every citizen great concern. However, it is evident that, quote, the sense of security is greatest where the level of confidence in the institutions of law enforcement and justice is high. What matters most is the confidence in the capacity of states to protect their citizens and to ensure justice. The general situation of human rights in Jamaica is one of unequal access and protection for vulnerable populations and a state response that privileges rights abrogation for some rather than equity and equality for all. I will now ask Mr. David Silvero to continue the presentation. I'd like to thank the Commission for this opportunity. Um, due to limited time, I shall update and highlight just a few of the areas of recommendations made by the Commission in its report, but please feel free to ask any questions on other topics you may have concerns about. There are many references to police impunity in the IACHR report of 2012 in its recommendations of both Chapter 2 and Chapter 3. Unfortunately, your call for accountability has not been heeded with the vigor hoped for. In 2012, the U.S. State Department's Human Rights Report on Jamaica listed summary executions and corruption as major issues within the Jamaican security forces. One of the principal factors that have motivated the surge in unlawful police killings is the persistence of impunity. It is the view of JFJ that the extremely low number of police shooting cases that actually make it to the criminal courts is testimony to the obstacles to accountability that persist. It is the obligation and the duty of the government of Jamaica to carry out exhaustive and impartial investigations into all allegations of violations of the right to life, to identify and bring to justice the perpetrators, and to take effective measures to avoid the continuation of such violations. Some attempts are being made, but they are not enough. While the GOJ has gone forward with instituting the Commission of Inquiry into the killing of between 75 and more than 100 persons by the security forces in Tivoli, there are some concerns with regard to the terms of reference of the inquiry. It is important that a full, impartial, and effective investigation take place in order to prosecute and punish those responsible, including those who gave the orders, if it is appropriate to do so. 
Over the last four years, more than 1,000 Jamaicans have lost their lives as a result of actions of the Jamaican Security Forces, mainly the JCF. And almost half of these cases are being investigated by Indicom are Category A fatalities. This means that the fatalities were as a result of circumstances where there may have been no justification for the action taken by members of the security forces or by neglect. In the month of January of this year, there's a total of 22 deaths recorded at the hands of the security forces. Thus, we would appear we are heading for another year in which several hundred citizens of Jamaica will be killed by agents of the state. There have been recent reports in the local and international press made by both retired and serving members of the JCF alleging that senior officers in the JCF have ordered cold-blooded killings, thus confirming what has been known for years. Indicom's interim report to Parliament in 2012 states that there are over 300 fatalities being investigated by the organization. And this report gives accounts of police divisions with the highest levels of fatalities and also a number of policemen who have been involved in multiple fatalities over a very short period of time. Recently, they have had to take over more than 1,500 cold cases files that were formerly with the BSI. Although the state of Jamaica has stated a commitment to implement the recommendations of the Justice Reform Task Force, there has to date been no significant improvement over the years since the commitment was given. The legal system continues to be overburdened and major delays in the processing of cases has resulted in the justice system coming to a virtual standstill, while the lives of the persons with matters before the courts have essentially been put on hold. There's a culture of adjournments, as well as archaic and inefficient court administration practices, which all contribute to the gridlock. One such example was pointed out by Justice Campbell in the case of the Queen versus Byron Johnson and others, where the matter was set down for trial on 38 separate occasions without ever starting. Your recommendation that the coroner's court and also the special coroner's court, um, which is meant to investigate questionable deaths at the hands of state, be adequately staffed is unfulfilled. Like the rest of the judicial system, it is overburdened, under-resourced, painfully slow, and unable to effectively complete its mandate. Unfortunately, there is a backlog of more than 400 cases, and it gets between 80 and 100 cases per year referred to it for hearing. Given that at its most efficient function, the special coroner can expect to complete about 60 cases per year, the impossibility of the task facing the special corridor is, co coroner is evident. However, the practice of professional jurors has ceased completely in Kingston. Outside of Kingston, there are occasions where the court authorities have to be reminded not to use this approach. The Commission's recommendation to expand support and continue to monitor legal aid services has been done due to has not been done due to financial constraints. The lawyers who assist in this program find it hard to collect fees earned and are only paid for initial representation. Any further assistance is done pro bono, if at all. Court users frequently experience difficulty accessing and using the legal aid system, particularly where persons are being detained without charge. The Legal Aid Act provides for detainees who have not been charged to have the opportunity of being represented by duty counsel However, detainees are often denied their right to counsel, and in some instances, police officers fail to contact duty counsel for several weeks for detainees who have not been charged but are merely in police lockups. Persons are regularly detained, denied their right to have bail considered forthwith, and sometimes are detained for months before a bail application is made. Challenges in obtaining timely forensic and ballistic reports have been a major obstacle in completing investigations, getting those cases before the courts and having them heard in a timely manner. It is important to state, as has been done by Indicom, that two-thirds of the cases of fatal shootings under investigations would have been complete if the ballistic and forensic certificates had been provided by the government forensic lab. The lab is a department of and also funded by the Jamaica Constabulary Force. Just as JCF is analyzing the evidence against itself. They have resisted attempts by Indicom to set up an independent laboratory. Indicom has lobbied for the establishment of its own forensic laboratory in a bid to conduct its own ballistic analysis of, <coughs> of evidence. Although it has received financial assistance to secure equipment and experts, the independent body is still hampered by the fact that pursuant to the Firearms Act, it is only the commissioner of police who is authorized to designate someone a ballistics expert. 
Indicom's request for its ballistic expert to be designated as such by the Commission of Police has been met with opposition. Generally, like the other institutions within the Jamaican justice system, the DPP grapples with the problem of insufficient resources. There is a pro bono institutional bias, even though it is denied by the government of Jamaica. And when the DPP does pursue prosecution, it does not do so effectively. There is a backlog of cases involving police killings, and the average time taken to determine whether to even bring charges is between two to three years. Your request for a system to review the decisions of the office of the DPP has gone unheeded. Indeed, the DPP has told Parliament they have no right to question her, nor is she answerable to them. On the positive side, the office of the DPP did launch its disclosure protocol in late 2013. The creation of Indicom has been an improvement with regard to accountability, and there's a marked advancement in the manner and seriousness which complaints of abuse are now being treated. However, it has been a great concern that a lack of cooperation between Indicom and the DPP and challenges to its authority by the JCF are hampering its smooth operation. Indeed, Indicom has had to use the courts to enforce its legally given mandate and clarify the scope of its powers. The Parliament and the Government of Jamaica must heed your recommendations to strengthen and reinforce its support for this much needed organization and reject the attempts to curtail its investigatory and prosecutorial powers. This is necessary to regain the trust of the people who for too long have been abused by state agents. I'll now hand you over to Mr. Alexa Goff for the next part. Honorable Commissioners, I am here on uh, behalf of Jamaicans for Justice to provide an update on recommendations focusing on chapters four um, on conditions in prisons and the rights of persons deprived of uh, their liberty and uh, chapter six regarding the rights of the child. First, I will address recommendation B in chapter four of the 2012 report that recommends taking measures to resolve the problem of overcrowding um, and unsanitary conditions in prisons and police lockups. Police lockups are designed for very short periods of detention. However, in Jamaica, these pretrial detention facilities hold detainees suspected of crimes for up to four or five years in appalling conditions. Indicom provides an example of the current situation in their 2012 report to Parliament. They describe a horrendous incident that took place in 1992 where three men died in an overcrowded cell from lack of oxygen. This, they stated, and I quote, in 2012, some 20 years later, since the Agana Barrett incident, there are still reports of overcrowding. And considering the entries in police station diaries, it would seem there is widespread concern about the conditions under which prisoners are kept. The similarity between this situation and the incident in 1992 is that the conditions that exist in these lockups presently are sufficient to bring about a repeat of the tragedy of 1992." End quote. Commissioners. The total capacity of our police lockups is just over 1,700. Uh, reports from the police indicate that on average, there are at least 2,100 citizens in these cells. The situation in prisons is no different. As you, see, as you can see from this, this slide, the ideal capacity of adult prisons uh, currently stands at 2,650. However, on average, there are 3,600 uh, inmates in our facilities. Therefore, commissioners, the state has not addressed this recommendation. The other recommendation I wish to address regarding prisons and people deprived of their liberty is chapter, is chapter four recommendation I, which focuses on rehabilitation programs and facilities for the mentally ill. The DCS states an aim to facilitate inmates rehabilitation and reintegration as law abiding citizens. However, the budget allocations speak to a different philosophy. For 2012, 2013 to 2014 budget, DCS roughly spends 84% on incarceration and approximately 10% on rehabilitation. These figures are the quantitative manifestation of skewed priorities. Regarding mentally ill inmates, some are housed in special blocks and others are a part of the general population. However, few are receiving the treatment they need. Major General Saunders, permanent secretary in the Minister of, Ministry of National Security, reported to Parliament this January that the Correctional Department did not have adequately trained staff or appropriate infrastructure to treat persons with mental health challenges and that the ratio of psychiatrists to mentally ill inmates was unacceptable. Now I'll provide an update uh, on two of the Commission's recommendations regarding the rights of children. 
Chapter 6, Recommendation E, stated that children should be deprived of their children who are deprived of their liberty should be done. This should be done as a last resort and for the minimum period of time necessary. A lack of diversion programs has led to the detention of children for mostly nonviolent and or status offenses. In 2012, 73% of children detained had committed nonviolent offenses, and this was the highest percentage in the previous five years, with an average hovering around 70%. Being deemed beyond control is the most common reason for children to enter the justice system. Between 2009 and 2012, a total of 154 children were admitted to correctional institutions under this designation. Since 2012, over 300 children have been detained in a police lockup for at least two days after being deemed uncontrollable or in need of care and protection. And we have learned that from the data provided by the Jamaica Constabulary Force that almost 100% of children detained in police lockups spend two days or more there, with some spending as many as 34 days. Serious challenges exist with the data collection regarding children in conflict with the law, especially um, children in police lockups. <clears throat> Excuse me. The government has announced plans to, <coughs> pardon me, back to uh, the data. Serious challenges exist, and this, this slide gives an example of uh, the current challenges. I can speak more about it in our discussion section um, after the state's uh, presentation. Finally, Chapter 6, Recommendation F, stated that children should be detained in adequate facilities, not held with adults, and that there should be a separation according to legal status. As stated earlier, children deemed in need of care and protection and beyond control are still being kept in police lockups. The government has announced plans to retrofit police stations to house some of these children. JFJ is uncertain how a police lockup will be an appropriate and adequate facility for children. It must be noted that in September 2013, the state transferred the entire population of girls from Fort Augusta Adult Correctional Center, Horizon Adult Remand Center, and Diamond Crest Juvenile Correctional Center to the South Camp Road facility in Kingston, resulting in girls no longer being kept with adults in prison. There certainly have been steps in the right direction, and for a brief moment, Jamaica could claim that children and adults were separated in remand and correctional facilities. However, not long after, a number of male children from Metcalf Street Remand Center for Boys were transferred to Horizon. Reports are that boys were charged, who were charged for more serious crimes and were planning to escape were transferred there. As of February 20th, 2014, five boys are being kept at Horizon Adult Remand Center. Therefore, the state has not adequately addressed these recommendations. Commissioners, adults in overcrowded prisons and children in lockups are not acts out of our control. These situations were created from a set of choices we have made. They are, immor they are immoral, inadequate, and they have to change. Thank you very much for this opportunity. Commissioners, um, I want to present on behalf of JFLAG and the Caribbean Vulnerable Communities. And our focus is going to be on the chapter seven and the last page of that chapter, which is the six recommendations that were made. And we're going to provide an update as to how we understand the situation. As it relates to the recommendation regarding legislative reform, we can confirm based on research that we have done and the actions on the ground that there is very little action from the government, despite some positive talk. Um, from various quarters, including statements from the Prime Minister and the Minister of Justice. There's, there's a seeming unwillingness to confront legislative review, review, despite various recommendations coming out of a number of studies that have been done. And that is a, an issue which continues to be of concern to us. Um, in relation to the recommendation for actions to prevent abuse, there are no active measures on the ground to defend sexual minorities, despite evidence that there is an increasing willingness and support from the public for a more active stance by the government. And that is evidenced by a study done by Box Hill in 2012. Um, there's, there was an articulation of a um, diversity policy within the Jamaica Constabulary Force, but nothing much has happened beyond the articulation of that policy, because our work has shown us that it is still left to the discretion of individual police to institute that. And um, 
there's a lot of training that needs to happen in respect of that particular policy. And we have no specific campaigns geared towards addressing anti-discrimination in relation to the LGBTI population in Jamaica. The next recommendation related to training for criminal justice officials on LGBTI rights. And we can confirm that there have been no actions in this regard. Um, in fact, we feel that that is not a priority issue based on how the thing is evolving. In um, 2012, UNDP sponsored an HIV-related um, sensitization with selected justices, but since then, there has been no follow-up and there is no structured program developed or being developed to respond to the issues of LGBTI folks in Jamaica. Uh, with respect to the recommendation around police training and investigation, we can confirm that very limited action has occurred on that, and where it has occurred, it has been driven by civil society. And the, there is continued evidence of police abuse, especially as it relates to homeless MSM, which are men who have sex with men, many of whom identify as transgender persons. As recently as um, last month, the police carted off a group of these young men to um, the lockup, arrested them, charged them. The judge then had to make a decision that loitering in a public sewer um, was not a problem. And so that is something that still continues to uh, affect the LGBT uh, population in Jamaica. There is no designated investigative unit as recommended, and there are no sanctions for police initiated discrimination or abuse as you um, outlined in the report in 2012. We continue to see very high levels of violence, including mob attacks against the LGBTI community. And I think the most famous of which was the Dwayne Jones case in recent times. Uh, discrimination continues to be a major concern among the LGBTI population. Reporting to the police is also problematic. And one of the explanations that we have received from the members of the community is that the process is lengthy and frustrating. And so there's a low uptake of reporting by members of the LGBTI community. And where people have reported, we have found that investigation has been poor or at best inadequate. Um, with respect to your recommendation relating to training of healthcare workers and providers, there has been some limited progress, and that has been largely in partnership with JFLAG, who has trained a small cadre of um, healthcare workers. But major challenges around confidentiality continue to exist. We saw that in a recent study that was done, protocols where they exist, they lack sanctions. And we believe that the processes need to be institutionalized and we believe capacities need to be built to ensure that the limited gains are not lost. We have, we have decided to focus quite a bit on the HIV AIDS response because that is the greatest link that we have identified to addressing the issues of LGBTI community in Jamaica. And we can confirm that there have been some positive developments in respect of improved governance, um, some prevention successes, some elements of access to treatment, and there is an increased awareness, public awareness around the issues, but there continues to be a major challenge. There is a lack of an effective GPO approach to HIV um, integration. The Minister of Health continues to be the leader with very limited political buying from the other sectors of government, and there are many gaps, including under coverage of testing and treatment, and a breach of privacy and confidentiality for key population groups. Um, commissioners, criminalization of private consensual same-sex act, sex work, and drug use make it extremely difficult for these key populations to access HIV services. And it is our view that a lack of rec recognition by political and religious leaders of the relationship between criminalization, discrimination, and HIV continue to prove a key challenge for us. There is a high rate of HIV among MSM in Jamaica, and we feel that that is due to a lack of targeted programs and legislation to address issues of stigma and discrimination towards this population. There is no comprehensive HIV and AIDS law. There is no general anti-discrimination law. There is no human rights commission to which these issues can be addressed, and we cannot identify any legally enforceable law policy that can protect anyone against HIV-related discrimination. And we feel that the issue of funding will continue to prove a challenge for the HIV response. 
Um, in summary, and I've taken this sum we've taken this summary almost wholesale from the UN AIDS 2011 report. The country has integrated some elements of human rights in the national response to HIV. However, in many instances, new policies were not approved or implemented. It continues to criminalize same-sex sexual encounters, and stigma and discrimination remain a challenge and need to be addressed at all levels. Gay men, transgender people, sex workers, people living with HIV, and crack cocaine users face stigma and discrimination on a daily basis. Civil society involvement in the national HIV response should be greater and strengthened at all levels. I'd just like to wrap up this section of the presentation by saying that we come back to the beginning. Human rights abuses persist in Jamaica. Se insecurity of the citizens is a major challenge. And responses from the government have largely been <coughs> rights abrogating for some. Honorable Commissioners, as the only registered organization in Jamaica that focuses exclusively on advocating for the human rights of lesbian, bisexual, and trans women, Quality of Citizenship Jamaica, QCJ, would like to thank the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights for this opportunity. We'd also like to express appreciation to our partner organization, Aid Free World, for making our attendance possible. Allow me to introduce myself. I am Angeline Jackson, Executive Director and Founder of QCJ. With me is our Director of Administration and Co-Founder, Yalna Broderick. I'll speak directly to lesbian and bisexual, lesbian, bisexual and trans women within the, commission, the Commission's report. Women who have sex with women and trans individuals are vulnerable to the lesbophobia, biphobia and transphobia, which are given license by the 1864 Offenses Against the Persons Act. Police are reluctant to investigate crimes against LGBTI people, as the Commission noted in paragraph 271 of its report. The following incident is emblematic of police bias against non-heterosexual Jamaicans. Kishima Tullock, a masculine identified lesbian, was attacked in October 2013, details of which are in the written submission. While in hospital recovering, Kishima was arrested and charged for, for assault occasioning bodily harm, even though her attacker was not wounded. The Independent Commission of Inquiry, Indicom, has been called on to investigate the matter. To date, there has been no indication that it will do so. LBT women, lesbian, bisexual, transgender women in Jamaica remain vulnerable to assaults because of our sexual, sorry, sexual orientation, gender identity, and expression. This fact is illustrated in the following incidents. Laura, a trans woman who endured years of verbal assaults because of her gender identity and expression, she has been called a batiman, a she-male, and this derogatory speech escalated to physical violence when she was chased through halfway tree by a group of men in May 2004. She has also received numerous death threats from persons in her community. In June 2009, I was sexually assaulted and my friend raped. I went into more details in the written submission. I first attempted to notify the Center for Investigation of Sexual Offenses and Child Abuse, Sissoka, in St. Anne's Bay, St. Anne. I was, however, told by officers there to leave this lifestyle and go back to church. I then took the matter to the Sissoka unit in Spanish Town. There is a strong indication that what my friend experienced was a case of corrective rape, where heterosexual men rape lesbian and bisexual women to make them straight. There have been reports of three other victims of similar types of incidents. Despite the heinous nature of these attacks, as highlighted by the Commission in paragraph 269, there is no legislation that would designate them as hate crimes. QCJ acknowledges that there have been positive changes in sections of the Jamaica Constabulary Force. This is no doubt as a result of the stated policy of non-discrimination in policing, which the Commission of Police implemented in 2011. However, it must be pointed out that there is still, still need for vast improvements in how the police, handle, police deal with and respond to attacks against lesbian, bisexual women, and trans persons. Indeed, without serious reform, the entire LGBT community will continue to feel as though we have limited or no access to justice. There are no specific interventions, programs, or outreach to lesbian and bisexual women from the organizations that work on the national HIV and AIDS response. However, as the Commission points out in paragraph 300, and as outlined in my personal story shared, the increased risk of rape of lesbian and bisexual women heightens our vulnerability to contracting the virus. Please note that despite this risk, there has been no research to date into the actual levels of HIV within the LB population. 
Despite multiple promises to call for a parliamentary conscience vote to review the country's anti-sodomy law, the government has failed to act. In instead, the government has sought to defend the archaic statute in a case which will be heard in November of this year and in which the IACHR will be providing evidence. Finally, in light of the ongoing abuses against LBT Jamaicans perpetrated by state and non-state actors, we therefore humbly request that the IACHR urge the J Jamaican government to implement all the recommendations in the report which are still unmet by the state and which have already been addressed by Mr. Cruikshank. We further recommend that the government health sector recognize the increased risk of lesbian and bisexual women to HIV and AIDS by creating targeted interventions for this community and that the national HIV program disaggregate data based on the sexual orientation of women as well as men as it currently does. We further recommend that the government work with the organizations currently supporting the homeless LGBT youth in Kingston. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you for the perfect timing. Um, I'm now going to ask the state to make their presentation. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, members of the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights, uh, Professor Shelton, other mem members of the commission at the level of the Executive Secretariat, members of the Jamaican civil society groups, ladies and gentlemen, good morning. The state of Jamaica <coughs> is participating today in the follow-up of the IACHR's report on the situation of human rights in Jamaica with reference to the note from the commission on the subject dated 27 February 2014. My name is Stephen Vassiani and with me is Mrs. Julia Hyatt, Minister Alternate Representative of the Permanent Mission of Jamaica to the Organization of American States. The Commission visited Jamaica from December 1 to 5, 2008 to observe the overall human rights situation in the country. It approved a report on the situation in Jamaica on December 31, 2011. Following certain exchanges with the government of Jamaica, the formal report on the situation of human rights in Jamaica was approved by the Commission on August 10, 2012. Against this background, and bearing in mind that more than five years have elapsed since the December 2008 visit of the Commission team, which ultimately formed the basis of its report, the Government of Jamaica takes the view that this follow-up effort should provide an opportunity for the Commission to update some of its information on the situation in Jamaica. The Commission will recall that the Government of Jamaica made certain responses to aspects of the draft report of the Commission, which were incorporated into the report approved in August 2012. The Government also offered responses to the final report of the Commission in February 2013. To the extent that these responses have not been overtaken by the passage of time and events, the Government maintains that they are correct. The government's presentation today seeks then to provide an update on developments concerning human rights in Jamaica. We have presented a written document with this update to the commission, but I wish to note some of the main points from this written document. I should also say that having regard to the fact that the report was published in August of 2012, uh, some of the comments that have been made about things not yet being done uh, can be answered by saying not enough time has elapsed as yet for them fully to have been addressed. <clears throat> With reference to chapter two of the, of the report, Citizen Security and Human Rights, <clears throat> chapter two addresses the situation of violence and insecurity in Jamaica. Jamaica acknowledges that high rates of crime and violence continue to have a negative effect on the country's human rights situation, and particularly on the vulnerable members of the society. The government remains committed to addressing this problem. One of the ways the government has sought to address the problem of uh, violence and citizen insecurity is through anti-gang legislation. Since the adoption of the Commission's report, the Jamaica House of Representatives on February 18, 2014, passed the Criminal Justice Suppression of Criminal Organizations Act, also referred to as the Anti-Gang Bill. 
The bill defines a criminal organization as including any gang which has as one of its purposes the commission of one or more serious offenses. The act, when it comes into effect, will, pro will make provision for the disruption of criminal organizations by criminalizing, among other things, the leadership, management, or direction of a criminal organization, the provision of a benefit or obtaining a benefit from a criminal organization, aiding or abetting a criminal organization, and the recruitment of persons to be part of a criminal gang. This legislation went to the Senate and was approved in the Senate on March the 7th. So it is awaiting a final signature of the Governor General. Then it will become law. It's an attempt to tackle uh, criminal activities at the gang level. And it is acknowledged that Jamaica has a serious problem with gangs. Another development since the time of the Commission's report is that the Jamaican Cabinet has approved the National Crime Prevention and Community Strategy, this in October 2013, and this strategy emphasizes social inclusion as a way of helping to reduce crime and a reduction in the fear of crime, the promotion and participation of citizens in community activities and changes in attitudes um, in various communities. It also stresses the role of individuals in dealing with crime, governance, the role of governance in addressing crime, and emphasizes knowledge-based policing. The, thirdly, the government has launched the United for Change initiative, a campaign that was launched in December 2013. This is aimed at empowering each citizen to work towards reducing criminal activity. It is also designed to re rekindle hope in communities that are particularly challenged by crime. And as part of this initiative, uh, the Minister of National Security indicated that there are now um, mobile applications, uh, I think you call them apps, um, but through which persons can report to the police um, using modern technology things that they know. This is a, a way of trying to cut down on the notion that um, inform of a dead and that, that person should not report crimes to the police. So there are modern ways of communicating with the police. And also the program involves the establishment of a national youth violence prevention forum and emphasis on citizen security and justice. The Commission's report in Chapter 2 also addressed the problem of killings at the hands of the security forces. Jamaica accepts that challenges persist in respect of allegations of abuse by agents of the state. The government maintains that not all killings by agents of the state are unlawful as casualties result, too, from the use of justifiable force by agents of the state in the lawful execution of their duties pursuant to self-defense. The Tivoli incursion was uh, addressed in the Commission's report. With respect to violence and killings in May 2010, the Commission's report stated at paragraph 38 that to date there has been no official accounting for many of the deaths that occurred during the state of emergency associated with the Tivoli Gardens problem. On this matter, the public defender in Jamaica, Mr. Earl Witter, was charged with conducting an investigation into the Tivoli incursion. The public defender submitted his report on April 29, 2013. The government is also in the process of setting up, setting up a commission of inquiry, as you have heard, to consider the activities, circumstances, and other issues relating to the Tivoli matter. There were public consultations concerning the terms of reference of the commission of inquiry. And on February 21, 2014, three persons were appointed as members of the commission of inquiry. One member has requested to be excluded from the commission, and the government is now considering persons who may replace that member who has withdrawn. So we anticipate that the commission of inquiry will start its hearing soon. And on a related matter, parliament has passed the Commission of Inquiry Amendment Act 2013, and this is intended to strengthen the effectiveness of commissions of inquiry. 
This act increases fines and penalties for refusal to appear before a commission of inquiry without reasonable cause or for refusal to produce documents. The amendment also prohibits the giving of false or misleading evidence in proper dealing with documents and the intimidation of witnesses. It also establishes the offense of contempt of the commission. Still with respect to the matter of killings at the hands of agents of the state, there is the issue of training. The Commission in indicates in the, its report uh, under the heading, The Evolution of the Problem of Killings by the Police, uh, that this is a serious matter for Jamaica and that tr greater training needs to be uh, encompassed. The government reiterates its commitment to the protection of the right to life and other fundamental rights and freedoms guaranteed in the Jamaican Constitution. Training of members of the Jamaica Constabulary Force is designed to promote fair and impartial treatment of all individuals, sensitivity to gender, sexual and religious considerations, and with an awareness of cultural diversity. The training program of the Jamaica Constabulary Force includes a practicum in human rights of more than eight hours conducted by highly esteemed lawyers and more than three full days of paraprofessional counseling training conducted by the psychology department of the Northern Caribbean University. The Jamaica Constabulary Force also relies on trainers drawn from governmental and non-governmental organizations, including members of the judiciary, the office of the DPP, the Center for the Investigation of Sexual Offenses and Child Abuse, the University of the West Indies, and a number of human rights NGOs including, I believe, Jamaicans for Justice. Chapter three of the Commission's report. Chapter three of the report on, on the administration of justice highlights what the Commission has perceived as the lack of state-provided legal assistance and legal aid. The Commission referred, among other things, to a shortage of attorneys willing to serve as duty counsel to provide legal services, primarily because of a history of long delays in payment and the inadequacy of the fees. The government can report that since the Commission's report, the list of duty counsel has increased to over 400 attorneys, with a growing number of attorneys applying to be empaneled. Uh, some people point out that this is related to the fact that the Normal Manor Law School has increased the number of uh, graduates in recent years, and therefore there are more lawyers who are willing and able to assist in the process of uh, legal aid. The increase in the number of attorneys applying to participate as duty counsel will also significantly enhance the ability of the legal aid counsel to ensure access to duty counsel outside of urban areas, which was something noted by the commission in its report. All police stations are required to maintain a list of duty counsel. The legal aid counsel is current, currently considering the development of a system of verification concerning the posting of such lists and the notification of detainees of their right to duty counsel. And fourthly, the legal aid counsel is revising the fee structure for payment of duty counsel. And the Ministry of Justice has recently implemented a system of electronic payment of fees, which should reduce the time lag in payment. Another matter of concern under this heading, in paragraph 159 of its report, the commission referred to the, quote, the controversy about whether Indicom has the authority to arrest persons after laying charges against them. This controversy and its related issues have been addressed by the Constitutional Court of Jamaica in its judgment of July 2013 in the Police Federation et al and the Commission of the Independent Commission of Investigations and the Attorney General. In essence, the court found that Indicom has the power to arrest both under common law and by virtue of the legislation establishing Indicom. Indicom may bring charges and initiate prosecutions of members of the police force, and there is no requirement for a ruling of the DPP before arrests and charges are brought by Indicom. So Indicom is empowered to pursue matters relating to police killings and police abuse in the courts without the approval of the DPP. The DPP, however, retains the authority to take over 
and or discontinue any prosecution where such action is deemed appropriate by the DPP, consistent with the terms of the Jamaican Constitution. The Police Federation et al. have filed an appeal against this decision, but for the moment it stands as the law of Jamaica that Indicom may proceed against police officers. With reference to chapter four of the commission's report, conditions in prisons and penitentiaries and the rights of persons deprived of liberty. On the matter of prison conditions, conditions in some of the country's prisons and lockups remain poor and need to be addressed. The government also notes the following. Plans are currently being pursued with a view to establishing a new 5,000 bed correctional facility to house both male and female inmates from Fort Augusta, the Tower Street Correctional Facility, and the St. Catherine Correctional Center. And these are the, the, the correctional centers with the worst conditions. With respect to girls and young ladies, all girls and young ladies previously housed at the Horizon Adult Remand Center and the Fort Augusta Adult Correctional Center have now been relocated to the South Camp Juvenile Correctional and Remand Center. There are, as of March 24, 2014, 17 boys and one girl in lockups. Our understanding is that these persons are in lockups largely because they are on remand and they, they are taken, they are in the lockups because their cases are being heard and they are deemed to be flight risks or dangerous persons, although they are young, and so they are detained in the lockups during the course of the, the trial. So that the practice of the Jamaican government with respect to children is to take them to centers for the detention of young people, save when they are in remand during trial. That is the practice. Chapter five, rights of women. On the question of gender discrimination, the Charter of Rights passed in 2011 expressly prohibits discrimination on the basis of sex. With respect to the participation of women in public life, there are undoubted signs of progress. Prime Minister Portia Simpson Miller assumed office for the second time in 2011. Several other important offices of state are held by women, including the Chief Justice, the Director of Public Prosecutions, the Solicitor General, four cabinet ministers, various permanent secretaries, more than 10 of, of 19 ambassadors, and a significant number of Supreme Court and Court of Appeal judges. There continues to be scope for improvement within parliament, a point noted in the commission's report. Currently, seven of 60 members of the House of Representatives, about 12%, and six of 21, about 28% of the senators are women. There have been discussions concerning whether or not a quota system should be introduced in Parliament with a view to ensuring uh, a set number of women uh, becoming members of Parliament, but th these, are still th these discussions have not reached the Parliament itself. They, they are just being considered in the public sphere. As of 2012, women represented 59.6% of the public sector and men 40.4% of the public sector. With respect to violence against women, the government has developed the National Strategic Action Plan to eliminate gender-based violence in Jamaica. The plan was prepared by the Bureau of Women's Affairs with support from UN Women. It is designed to raise awareness concerning gender-based violence and provide gu guidance for the development and implementation of programs to address this problem. Chapter six, the rights of children. Yesterday, 
the Commission held a working meeting with the Government of Jamaica and Jamaicans for Justice concerning the question of girls held in adult correctional facilities. Some of the arrangements made in respect of the South Camp facility, which is now fully operational, were considered. Other issues, including the situation of children in lockups, were mentioned or addressed briefly within the limits of time allotted. Chapter 7, Discrimination Based on Sexual Orientation and Gender Identity. The Commission has been critical of Jamaica on the question of discrimination based on sexual orientation and gender identity. The Government of Jamaica rejects violence against persons on the basis of their sexual orientation and more generally wishes to ensure the protection of the rights of all Jamaicans. The Jamaican Parliament has not taken action to revise the Offenses Against the Person Act, which criminalizes homosexual sex and gross indecency. Modifying the law would be controversial, as the majority of Jamaicans do not approve of the homosexual lifestyle. The question of modifying the law has been the subject of some degree of public discussion recently. And in this regard, I should note that there is greater willingness on the part of so some persons to speak publicly in support of uh, defending uh, the rights of persons to engage in homosexual sex. Um, there was a time when it would have been risky for persons so to do. Um, that is seen by some as a sign of a gradually changing perspective on the part of some Jamaicans on this matter. But it is also to be noted that there is resistance to change, in, um, particularly among more conservative uh, groups in the country. Most church groups have expressed um, reluctance to have the laws changed and some civil society groups also have expressed reluctance. So there is a debate going on in the society on this matter. The Ministry of Justice is in dialogue with the United Nations Development Program on aspects of the Offenses Against the Person Act with particular focus on the public health disadvantages of the current law in the fight against HIV AIDS. And as uh, Mr. Crookshank mentioned, the Ministry of Health has taken the lead in seeking to promote increased awareness on uh, the dangers relating to HIV AIDS and the, the, the risks associated with prompting homosexual persons to hide the fact that they are homosexual persons and the risks in relation to HIV AIDS. The Minister of Justice has also taken part in these discussions and has acknowledged the link between the current state of the law and the risk of HIV AIDS um, being increased in the country. Jamaica has also been in dialogue with an, a, a Caribbean group called PANCAP headed uh, by Dr. Eddie Green, who is also the UN Special Envoy on HIV AIDS for the Caribbean. Um, and PANCAP has organized meetings with the church in Jamaica with a view to having a discussions about HIV AIDS risks and the current law relating to homosexual activity. Chapter 8, The Rights of Persons with Disabilities. In its report, the Commission noted that the state has been working over several years on a draft Disabilities Act to make, to make locations and services throughout Jamaica more accessible to the disabled. The state can report that the Ministry of Labor and Social Security has prepared a draft National Disability Bill, which was submitted to the Legislative Committee of the Cabinet in March 2014. The draft bill has been sent by the Legislative Committee of the Cabinet to the Chief Parliamentary Council for revision on certain aspects. The President of the Senate in Jamaica is, is, is blind. Other general updates. 
establishment of a national human rights institution. The government is currently considering the establishment of a national human rights institution, which would be charged with the promotion and protection of human rights. While a final decision has not yet been taken, the possible structure and scope of responsibilities of the institution are being considered within the Ministry of Justice. Corporal punishment. The Law Reform, Flogging and Whipping Abolition Act of 2013 was enacted in March 2013. The Act abolishes flogging and whipping as a penalty for any offense and makes consequential amendments to Jamaican law. Trafficking in Persons Amendment 2013. The Trafficking in, Trafficking in Persons Suppression and Punishment Act was amended in 2013 in order to increase the penalties for certain offenses under the Act from 10 to 20 years in prison. The amendment also includes a definition of debt bondage, which was not present in the Principal Act. The amendment also provides for increased penalties where offenses are committed in aggravating circumstances, such as where the victim is a child. And finally, adolescent mothers. The policy for reintegration of school age mothers into the formal school system was officially launched in November 2013. This policy allows adolescent mothers to re-enter the formal school system without duress and is intended to encourage fully the education of girls. Madam Chair, uh, those are our submissions and we appreciate this opportunity to address the Thank commission. Thank you very much, um, Ambassador Vassiani. I am now, I am joined by several of my colleagues here today. Um, I have uh, to my left uh, immediate past president of the commission, uh, Commissioner Jesus Rosco. I have on my right immediate second vice president, uh, Commissioner Ortiz, who I know has a special interest in Jamaica. Uh, she's also a rapporteur for children. Uh, we have with us Commissioner, one of our newest commissioners, uh, Commissioner Vanucci. We also have with us Deputy Executive Secretary, uh, Elizabeth Abimershed. So I'm going to ask, first of all, Commissioner Ortiz um, to speak uh, as mainly as rapporteur on the rights of children. Muchas gracias, señora presidenta. Eh, pido disculpas por mi llegada tardía. Es que no me siento muy bien de salud y me fui a hacer un control. Pero um, pude leer el material que nos preparó la secretaría, escuchar la última parte de la presentación de los peticionarios, a quienes agradezco mucho su presencia aquí. Y también muchísimas gracias al embajador Vaciana y a la ministra que le acompaña. Eh, para la comisión es una oportunidad muy linda este encuentro para hacer un, un repaso, un seguimiento al, a la, al informe realizado después de la visita in loco. También saludo la presencia de la comisionada Dina Shelton, que estaba muy involucrada en este informe. Como Relatora de Derechos del Niño, me, me gustaría eh, referirme en primer lugar al proyecto de ley eh, contra las maras y todo lo que el contexto por el cual ustedes están sacando una ley contra las maras. En, en la región, señor embajador, en la región de las Américas hay distintas experiencias de cómo abordar el problema de, de la violencia, eh, tanto de los grupos organizados de jóvenes con distintos nombres en la región, como de las políticas de los estados para enfrentar ese problema. Y ya existen algunas experiencias claras de la, de la falta de respuestas positivas de políticas represivas. Eh, porque el, la, la organización de niños en maras muchas veces está vinculado a un mecanismo de protección frente a violencias múltiples que sufren en su vida cotidiana, eh, sobre todo por ausencia de políticas de los estados. 
Entonces, eh, vi, eh, crecen en un ambiente de violencia familiar y de violencia en la comunidad y de violencia en la escuela y de violencia con la policía y, y un mecanismo de protección muchas veces involuntario es hacerse parte de las maras eh, porque no encuentran protección en otro lado. Por lo tanto, eh, creo que el Estado tiene que tener en cuenta esa situación eh, consultar con los propios jóvenes eh, para encontrar las salidas adecuadas para ellos y que serán también las salidas adecuadas para el resto de la sociedad. Si en algo fracasan los sistemas de justicia juvenil es en la rehabilitación porque las comunidades que han expulsado a estos jóvenes que cometen infracciones, eh, difícilmente van a estar abiertos a recibirlos nuevamente, más aún si ya han cometido alguna infracción. Por lo tanto, no queda otro que apostar a la prevención, a la prevención dentro de la familia y dentro de la comunidad. Los espacios públicos, y no me refiero solo a Jamaica, que no conozco en profundidad, que me gustaría mucho conocer, porque como relatora estamos haciendo justamente unas, eh, eh, un informe, en este momento estamos en etapa de consulta para aprender la realidad. Me gustaría también visitar Jamaica para saber de qué manera el, la violencia armada organizada se hace cargo, contacta y recluta a adolescentes para la, la, los crímenes. Lo que sí sabemos que las cárceles están llenas de jóvenes que son víctimas del crimen organizado y que pocos adultos están detenidos y muchos jóvenes, sí. Eh, entonces, lo del proyecto de ley de Maras, me gustaría mucho conocer el proyecto. Sé que está a punto de ser aprobado por el, por el primer ministro, el gobernador. Eh, pero si en algo como Relatoría de Niñez podemos ser útiles para eh, evaluar esa propuesta de ley, con muchísimo gusto. No quiero eh, tomar tanto tiempo. Hay muchos temas que se han comentado en relación, por ejemplo, a la cantidad de niños que es la, la causa de, de privación de libertad, aunque sea en un régimen de no de cárcel, pero sí de una institución para adolescentes está la conducta incontrolable y eso no es un delito. Eh, y sin embargo, según lo que estaba viendo de lo presentado, es el número más alto de adolescentes eh, en instituciones eh, y privados de libertad. Quiero solamente hacer ese comentario, poner a la relatoría a disposición, tanto de la sociedad civil como del gobierno de Jamaica, y tener eh, otros espacios de diálogo más amplios. Gracias. Thank you. I'll now ask Commissioner uh, Orozco to speak. Gracias, Presidenta y Relatora para Jamaica. Eh, también para unirme al agradecimiento tanto a las distinguidas como a los distinguidos peticionarios uh, por su presentación, al igual que a la eh, digna delegación del ilustre Estado de Jamaica, por, encabezada por el embajador Bashani, eh, por, también por su presentación y la información muy valiosa que nos proporcionan para poderle dar seguimiento al, al informe de la Comisión Interamericana, que como se ha precisado, lo, se publicó en el 2012, se presentó precisamente por la entonces relatora, a quien saludo con afecto la excomisionada y expresidenta Dina Shelton y eh, eh, también eh, eh, se nos informa de que han, están proporcionando por escrito, leeremos obviamente con atención esta información, se ha puesto algún énfasis en algunos temas, pero yo sí atendiendo algunos de los aspectos que con mayor preocupación desde la Comisión Interamericana advertimos, a, agradeceríamos la alguna información eh, 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 a reserva de ver la que está por escrito, pero si se pudiera proporcionar lo más amplia posible y lo más específica relacionada con las políticas públicas 
eh, eh, específicas existentes en, en, en el Estado para erradicar la discriminación y la violencia con relación a las personas LGBTI y también lo relativo a las políticas públicas, protocolos eh, o medidas que han sido adoptadas, ya se han mencionado algunas, para que agentes de policía que hagan uso indebido de la fuerza de, se abstengan de, 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 y eviten eh, que hacer precisamente el uso indebido de la fuerza en el ejercicio de sus funciones de seguridad ciudadana. Lo mismo también la información específica, se ha mencionado algo a, con relación a los programas de capacitación eh, eh, que, que establecen, pero las instituciones y qué específicos programas existen en el Estado que permitan esa capacitación de agentes del Estado en materia de derechos humanos y concretamente con relación a los estándares del sistema interamericano. Y en este sentido también agradecería que la información o la perspectiva que tuviese la, 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 la sociedad civil con relación a estos temas. Muchas gracias, presidente. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like to make a few comments as rapporteur for Jamaica. Um, first of all, on the issue of gender, um, I, of course, it's considerable progress that the new constitution has now included um, sex gender as a basis for discrimination. Um, but I wondered about the notion of quotas why is it that there's a feeling, um, and it doesn't seem that this is a um, firm feeling, but there's a suggestion that if you had quotas for women in whatever field, whether it be politics, I don't know if one needs that, considering that the distinguished prime minister is a woman, but that is that is rather irrelevant because we're talking about as a whole. And I did note in the report that women still have uh, lower incomes when you consider it um, by industry. Uh, but I wondered about these quotas, how this would be a violation of the Constitution, because I think it's a well-established principle that if you have temporary positive measures which seek to correct discrimination, that that, in fact, would be consistent with constitutional mores and well, certainly with established international norms. So I just wanted to comment about that because that was in the written reports. And I also wanted to find out about the status of the sexual harassment bill. I had been reading something in the newspaper, and I didn't hear any updates on that. I think that would be very important. On the um, issue of children, um, I endorse a lot of my colleagues said here, I am particularly disturbed about the issue of children who are deemed out of control or who are deemed in care and protection, who really are victims of the system and who end up being treated as delinquents, quote unquote delinquents, um, because they are placed in institutions, they are placed in um, but they are deprived of their liberty. And I wonder at this point in the Caribbean, not just Jamaica, because this is a widespread problem, if we are to be honest, if we cannot now encourage some more creative strategies, we know about budgetary restrictions and so on, but really to have public awareness campaigns to encourage fostering, encouraging persons to foster children private. I have not seen that kind of campaign in the Caribbean. And it really is a very disturbing, it's a travesty of justice, because these children end end up often being offenders themselves because of the institu institutionalization. Um, I, in terms of um, the lockups, I just want to reiterate something I was saying yesterday in our meetings about the need to ensure that um, persons generally are not detained in lockups for long periods. I'm not going to spend too much time on that because clearly in terms of lockups, there's, not, there's very little supervision or accountability, if any. Um, the big one, sexual orientation, I, it would seem to me that there is very little real change. In Jamaica, very resistant issue. The reports that I read uh, from both sides before this meeting, there was some acknowledgement that in terms of the police protection, there had been some, but it seems to me that it's inconsistent. And so we can't depend on the whims of persons who may feel, okay, they should protect someone. There needs to be something stronger. We need to be able to sustain the protective mechanisms. And so I could just reiterate the commission's 
government's position on this, in, in, in particular since Jamaica, in Jamaica, although it might share homophobia with the rest of the region, the level of violence is really quite startling in Jamaica. And we really have to point this out uh, when we speak about um, Jamaica. I noted that JFLAG said that one of the ways in which you're looking at it is through the lens of HIV, and there has been some progress. That might be okay, but it does not um, in any way, I think, eliminate the state's obligation to uh, protect against discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation, on the basis of sexual identity, um, which of course is all to do with dignity and personhood. So that we might get some relief through the HIV mechanism with which I'm familiar, but that is that is not far enough. We need to go much further. I think we need some clarification about the role of the DPP. There's some discussion in, which, in relation to the role of the DPP and Indicom, and we welcome more information. I am aware, um, I, I don't believe Jamaica is any different, that the DPP is a constitutional office which is independent, and it really cannot be supervised by the, um, by the state per se, and that is accepted. It's entirely independent. There's separation of powers doctrine, but there does need to be um, some sort of mechanism for judicial review. So so if there is an issue with the office of the DPP, I'm wondering why it is that her or his decisions are not being challenged. So we'd welcome some um, clarification on that. I want to applaud Jamaica for the Progress and Disabilities um, Act bill, sorry, it's not an act as yet. I hope it will be an act. I have tremendous confidence in President of the Senate, Floyd Morris, whom I have the honor to have worked with in the past. But we will need to monitor this because that is a very important topic for us in the Commission, one of our new topics. So we'll be monitoring. And finally, I wanted to just to say a bit about um, the Anti-Gang Act. I share Commissioner Ortiz's um, uh, unease, let's say, about using repressive regimes, but it's more than that for me. We know that this act would have a lot of more impact on the youth, and I am concerned about due process in relation to the act, in particular since Jamaica already is being accused as a state of acting in arbitrary ways when it comes to um, dealing with alleged criminals. So I wondered about um, how does one determine who is a gang member? Member. What are those sorts of guarantees into the presumptions of innocence? I, I think we need to get a lot more information. So those are my thoughts. Um, I know that um, um, Elizabeth Mimershed has some important questions, so I'm going to ask her to speak. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Just um, two questions of follow-up. The first, concerning the issue of accountability for deaths involving members of the security forces, and accepting, as the ambassador said, that there may be instances of legitimate self-defense. At the time of the Commission's visit, um, the information that the Commission received indicated that between 1999 and the end of 2008, three police officers had been convicted of murder of the total number of accusations that had been brought. And so the Commission, in its report, spent a lot of time analyzing difficulties or challenges in the structure and processes of investigation, mentioning the need for stronger safeguards for independence and impartiality, and questions, for example, of understaffing and underfunding of the forensic lab and the pathology unit. And the commission visited all of the different instances, including the forensic lab and the pathology unit. So I think one of the points that it would be interesting to receive updated information about is this question of um, the management of these kinds of cases <clears throat> and whether there have been any changes in the structure or the processes for investigation of deaths at the hands of members of the security forces. And the other point that I wanted just to ask a quick follow-up question about is the question of legal aid because the Commission talked to legal service providers um, who, ser who had served as duty officers um, about some of the difficulties, the shortages of attorneys, um, delays in payment, inadequate payment, and the changes that you mentioned that are under consideration could make an important contribution. The fact that there would be <clears throat> more than 400 attorneys who would be signed up now would be an important change to know about. It would be, I think, really useful to have information about whether there are measures now to 
Mm. Ensure oversight and accountability for police officers to notify detainees about the right to duty counsel. And it would be useful to have updated information in the event that there are changes adopted to the fee structures so that we could know about that for the follow-up. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much. We am going to give each of you eight more minutes to make further observations and respond to questions. Thank you, petition. Thank you, Madam Commissioner. Um, I'd like to bring up one point, which is regarding the Anti-Gang Act. Um, Ambassador Vassiani has mentioned it, but he's, he's forgotten to mention the fact that um, there is a clause in there that says that suspicion of involvement with a criminal gang is a specific offense. I want to repeat that for you. Suspicion of involvement is an offense. This removes the evidential burden of proof from the state. What will happen is a policeman will say that a young boy is a member of a gang and he is arrested. Um, you know, it, it gives them far-reaching powers to simply identify individuals as members of a gang and extremely broad powers to charge them for, for justice accusation. That is a very big concern of ours regarding the anti-gang legislation. I'll just mention a couple uh, points on uh, juvenile justice and the resources. The first that I'll say is just to reiterate that the majority of the um, children that are there should not be there. They're there for nonviolent offenses and the largest group, both for boys and girls, even though girls get a bit more attention in this category, um, uh, are deemed uncontrollable, um, which is uh, um, not a criminal offense. Um, so we, we believe that the resources have been misspent because we spend um, over 20 times more on children incarcerated than we do in ch uh, child in a school. Um, we spend two, over two million per child in juvenile justice. Uh, related to foster care, there have been campaigns to increase foster care, but there are uh, no, numerous issues that face a uh, foster care system, uh, as outlined by the OCA, the Office of the Children's Advocate, in 2009. Um, just connecting it with the, the, res the, the um, resources spent, we, s we give foster parents $48,000 Jamaican per year um, uh, uh, um, to take care of uh, their foster child. And this has not shifted in the last, uh, I believe it's eight or so years. And this has been a consistent um, point made by the Foster Care Association. Um, and uh, in relation to incarceration, we believe that it's an, it has been an ill-conceived reaction to something that's not uh, um, necessarily a, a violent incident, uh, a violent um, 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 situation. It's more public health. So we have about 50% of our inmates are poor and illiterate. Over 50% have dropped out from school. The, the, the most that they've attained in educational, um, um, educational attainment has been probably primary school. Um, about a third of them have mental health issues. Um, and so we think that uh, this is, uh, again, a misprioritization of where we have spent our resources and that we should look at decreasing the number of uh, um, inmates and uh, not building more prisons for more spaces. That's what I'll say. Thank you very much for these insightful questions and comments. A um, couple of things. We are very challenged by the anti-gang legislation. Um, I, CBC, JFLAG, JFGR, all members of the Jamaica Civil Society Coalition, who though not represented here, were very in, um, important parts of the um, representation in Parliament about this legislation. And after the passage of the revised bill, the JCSC made the point, and I just wish to read for the Commission, that the, um, new, the revised bill has strengthened the definition of criminal organization to make sure to include corner crews that the police call street gangs. We dispute that these young people are effectively criminal. They are young people banding together as young people do. Um, and we, the JCSC went on to say this step is astounding because it comes straight out of the paramilitary position put forward by the police force, which is set out in the introduction of the report. 
Um, so we're very, very concerned that it is going to criminalize young people who are joining together for their own protection, for their own growth and development. Normal adolescent growth and development involves peer groupings. Um, I want to put on the table that the uh, read Tivoli Gardens inquiry, the public defender himself held a press conference just this week to say that he was concerned about the terms of reference and he criticized them. Um, Plans have been afoot for a new prison for 30 years. I'm glad to hear we have new plans afoot. I'd like to see implementation. Um, in regard to rights, the, the ambassador said that correctly that most people in Jamaica are not in favor of accepting homosexual behavior. But rights are not subject to people's feelings. Rights are rights. And to clarify for the Commission, the language of the Charter doesn't speak to gender. It is a point that has been made over and over again in submissions to other international bodies as well as this one. The new Charter of Rights says the right to freedom from discrimination on the ground of, quote, being male or female. That's, in fact, the UN Human Rights Committee pointed out that this language is incompatible with normal standards and leaves people who are hermaphrodites by nature or intersex completely unprotected and leaves room for real challenges. It does not even speak to gender. Um, human rights training for the police is ongoing. We are trying to strengthen CBC, JFLAG, the vulnerability component of it, the vulnerable groups component of it. Training in the absence of sanction for breach of this training becomes meaningless. And this is a point we make over and over again, that there is lack of effective sanction for breaching people's rights. Finally, um, Commission, Commissioner Antoine asked about the structure and processes for investigation of killings by police. Indicom is a magnificent creation, which we feel ha has something we lay at the feet of the Commission's ruling in the Michael Gale when it pointed out the need for an independent investigative agency. It has been hampered at every turn. It has been challenged at every turn. The courts are standing behind it to this point in time. And so far, the review of the Indicom Act seems to suggest that the Parliament will stand behind it as a strong organization. We would urge the Commission to make that point, that it needs to be strengthened, it needs to be supported, and perhaps the Commission could review the cases on impunity from Jamaica to hasten the rulings to support this point to be made to the Jamaican government, that the numbers are unacceptably high and we must have some closure. Thank you. I'll now give the state the same amount of time to respond. Thank you. Eight minutes. Well, of course. Sorry, written. Um, you can't. Don't have to answer yes, all now. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, in in relation to the anti-gang bill, um, and the points raised by Commissioner Ortiz. Um, First of all, there are other initiatives in respect of young people um, that are being contemplated. So the anti-gang bill is not the only point in the horizon. I, I mentioned some, the National Crime Prevention and Community Strategy and the United for Change Initiative. Uh, secondly, the, Jamaica would welcome a visit by uh, Commissioner Ortiz to uh, address to look into matters relating to adolescents, to look into matters relating to the effect of the anti-crime legislation on children, and so forth. Um, the anti-crime legislation does not concentrate on children, but uh, one takes the point that it is likely to have a significant impact on young people. Um, the state is mindful of the very high level of crime and violence in Jamaica. More than 1,000 persons were killed last year. And the state has found itself in a position where things need to be done to address crime. On one level, 
you fight crime by fighting the crime or the criminal activities. On another level, you ensure that you try, to, you try to create a society where people have social mobility, where they have access to education, where their economic rights are given value. And so that is what the government has tried to do. If you look at the budget of the Jamaican government today, the first call for, for most of the funds is for debt repayment. I think it's about 60% of the budget. The next highest call is education. So security is, is down, down the line. So education is the next highest call because the government takes the view that you need to promote education as a way of ensuring that young people don't become alienated from the rest of society. The comments have been made about particular provisions in the anti-gang bill. One of the points made by the Attorney General when this bill was uh, being passed in the House of Representatives is that the provisions will be subject to constitutional challenge if, they, if, if persons wish to do so. Uh, and also, they do, the provisions do not re re remove the burden of proof. Um, the state or the person, the state will have to still meet the burden of proof as is normal in criminal cases, which is beyond reasonable doubt. Um, concerning uncontrollable behavior, which refers to young, young people and a, a means of detaining young people, the government has set up an interministerial task force on children. And one of the first recommendations from that task force is that this concept of uncontrollable or beyond control should be removed from the criminal law. It currently is in the criminal law in one or two places. It should be removed from the criminal law. So the government is aware of uh, the dangers of describing people as uncontrollable and then detaining them. Um, but I will convey to the government again the the strong message that has been delivered on, on that point by the Commission. Uh, with respect to the number of girls, I'll just say in passing, there are 38 girls or young, young uh, women in um, <coughs> detention at the South Cam facility. Some of them are on remand, some of them have had criminal orders um, and civil orders against them. With response to uh, Commissioner Orozco, uh, yes, we will, pro we have provided some information in writing, but we will seek to provide greater details in respect of discrimination and violence against LGBTI persons, the policy on the use of force, and the training in respect of human, human rights matters. Uh, concerning issues raised by the chair, um, the sexual harassment bill is within the office of the prime minister. There have been ongoing discussions about that. And um, when, it, when we have reports of any further progress, we'll bring it to the attention of the commission. Um, on the role of the DPP, as you say, the, the DPP is a constitutional office, and what the Constitution says is that the DPP has the power to discontinue cases or to take over cases. The DPP had argued in the case referred to that um, it was her right also to decide whether or not cases could be brought against the police. The court has said no. Indicom may bring cases against the police and ensure that these are, are carried to the end. Uh, so that is the, the state of the law at the moment. Uh, with respect to um, matters raised by Mrs. Abbey Merched, um, part of the answer is, it relates to Indicom um, and the work of Indicom. It's an independent body itself. Um, perhaps we might see it as a sign that it is working, that the police don't like it and, and cha have challenged it in court and challenged it, its powers. Um, Terence Williams, the independent commissioner, is a, a former DPP in the Virgin Islands, I believe, 
and has come to this task with enthusiasm and has been investigating matters. But he has a large backlog to deal with in addition to numbers going forward. Um, with respect to legal aid, we will seek to provide information on um, measures that are being taken in respect of oversight in police stations and in respect of the fee structure. Um, just a point about judicial review. Uh, there was a, an, an idea that the, the, the DPP's activities should be subject to review. They are subject to ju judicial review, and there are cases where the um, courts have considered whether or not the DPP acted um, properly in deciding whether or not to bring a matter forward. But very often, well, you, 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 the, the courts have said some discretion needs to rest with the DPP because that's the body that has the evidence and has the, to decide whether or not there is enough evidence really to launch a case against an individual. So that's the state of, of our law on the subject. Uh, but I don't know if there can be for s arrangements for another kind of review as well uh, at this time. I see my time is up. Thank you very much. Um, of course, we will welcome uh, more information by way of writing. And we also, I would like to say also as rapporteur, I am very open to further working meetings. I thought the one yesterday was very useful. So there's more opportunity for further dialogue. I want to thank uh, both parties, the State of Jamaica, for coming here today in a spirit of uh, dialogue and cooperation uh, to further progress with the report and also the petitioners coming out in full force and um, really giving us a lot of very rich information. This report is not the final word. We will continue to work on it and to uh, ensure that at the end of the day, we have a document that can further human rights in Jamaica. Thank you very much.